Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on our program, workplace diversity. It continues to lag in the tech industry. We'll talk with a woman at the forefront of efforts to change that. Plus, from edgy opera to political art, we'll bring you our Bay Area Arts Preview for August. But first, an important case for students with disabilities in California. This week, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights issued a finding that calls into question the use of prone restraint on special education students. It's a practice that involves immobilizing a student face down as a disciplinary method. The federal report found that Oakland student Stuart Candell had been denied an education and subjected to a hostile school environment after being restrained more than 90 times in less than a year, for an average of 29 minutes per incident. In this interview by Disability Rights California, which filed the complaint, Stewart describes his experience. Well, when they restrained me, there was two people, and pretend this is me, they held my wrists down, and they also held my legs down with their legs, and it really hurt because it was like they were grinding my legs into the floor, and it really, really was painful. Stewart's mom, Bonnie Candell, describes the changes she observed in her son, also in an interview with Disability Rights California. My son Stewart was restrained 94 times over a period of 11 months, and um, restraint is supposed to be an emergency solution, uh, not, not a behavior management solution. And um, this caused Stewart to be depressed, to be suicidal. He didn't want to go to school. He spent a whole lot of time out of the classroom not receiving instruction, um, and he gave up. He felt like nothing he did was going to work and that they were going to hold him down anyway. And joining me now with more on the debate over how discipline is carried out in special education are Such Lee, supervising attorney at Disability Rights California, and Jane Meredith Adams, a reporter at the online education news site EdSource. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Jane, how significant is this U.S. Department of Education ruling uh, decision uh, against the Oakland Unified School District? The lawyers I interviewed said it was very significant. A lawyer at the National Disability Rights Network, the national group in D.C. that oversees complaints in all 50 states, said it was groundbreaking. Huh. And, and um, how, what is prone restraint? Define that, because it's legal in California, Suge. What is it, and when is it supposed to be used? Prone restraint is when you have two to three adults, sometimes more, <laughs> holding down the child on the floor, face down. Um, and it's only supposed to be used, you know, for emergency containment. But as we saw in Stewart's case, it was being used much more often than that. And in fact, Jane, uh, you've done extensive reporting on this, uh, and there are a number of schools that use it. How often is prone restraint used in California? Well, EdSource did a series last year, and we examined, we did public records requests. We got 696 actual behavior incident reports, and of those reports that re included the restraining of a child, prone restraint was the most frequently used technique. And overall, the last time data was collected, there were 22,000 incidents that were considered behavioral incidents, emergencies, uh, and of those, the majority were restraint or seclusion. And what cons constitutes a behavioral emergency? So behavioral emergency, uh, behavioral emergency interventions are only really supposed to be used, according to the education code, in situations where there is spontaneous, unpredictable behavior that has a clear and present danger of causing, you know, serious physical harm. Um, and so, you know, that, that says to me that it's supposed to be like a true emergency, um, you know, that there's no other way to prevent somebody from injuring themselves except by intervening in some way. So in Stuart Candell's case, then, were they indeed emergencies? Ninety-two times is a lot in less than a year. OCR found that in a lot of instances it wasn't it sh it, it shouldn't have been used because OCR it wasn't. being office of uh, civil right rights. the office for civil rights said that you know the restraints shouldn't be have been used because it wasn't an emergency um, that they instead as Bonnie said were using it as like a routine behavioral management program 
And what are your concerns about prone restraint? Uh, can children be injured or even die? Absolutely. Um, there have been reported instances of death, and most times it is uh, what's called positional asphyxiation. It's where, you know, the, the child is on the ground and their breathing becomes compromised. Um, and this is especially exacerbated if the child has asthma or, you know, some kind of compromised, you know, you know respiratory system. And, and also just because you have small kids that are being held down by grown adults. Jane, there are uh, a lot of special education students in California. How many are there? There are about 700,000. It's about one in 10 students in California receive special education services. And that covers everything, all kinds of disabilities. Right. The largest group would be speech and hearing. Is that correct? Speech, speech and, language? and language? Speech and language disabilities followed by learning disabilities. So kids with dyslexia, uh, kids with uh, of harder hearing or speech impediments, they all get special ed. And, and, and so the, the prone restraint is often used um, for students who are considered perhaps among the most severe uh, in the disabilities group. Am I correct in that? They, they, their kids usually may be with the most severe forms of autism well, you know, or behavioral disorders. You're looking at kids who do have, you know, problem behaviors. And so the, you know, they're, they're using these emergency behavioral interventions because they're, they're, they're engaging in problem behaviors. But the problem is, is that when you use restraint, in seclusion are really counterproductive if you're trying to teach a kid how to behave appropriately. Seclusion meaning isolation. Right, where you're separated from your classmates in a separate space. And, um, you know, in California, it's illegal to do locked restraints. So you can't have a lock on the door. But, you know, school districts are still putting kids in rooms and preventing the kids from leaving. So, um, how is this monitored or reported? the way that these disciplinary methods are used. Are, are they monitored and reported? Well, that's what was so exciting about these findings, is that clearly monitoring is not happening, by and large. I think that's generally acknowledged. But this was one of the first times that the federal government said, Oakland Unified, you place this student, Stu Stewart, with his parents' consent, into a private special education school that held itself out as experts in managing behavior. It's a private school that does get public funds. It's, it's That's taxpayer right. money. Yes, so Oakland Unified pays that school out of state and federal and district money to educate that child as the expert. And I think what's happened in the past, and Suj could bear me out, is that districts sometimes then walk away. They say, okay, here was a kid we didn't know how to handle. We've solved the problem. And the federal government said, Oakland Unified, you have, in fact, discriminated against this student for allowing Stewart to be subject to prone restraints that a student who is not disabled would not be subject to. And that's a major finding. And I want to just say that, you know, from a statewide basis, there is no data. You know, to the extent that um, there was data in the past, um, in 2013, the state repealed the Hughes bill, and one of the requirements was that school districts had to report the number of emergency behavioral interventions they were using. Um, Why was it repealed? Well, it, it was the budget. The, a lot of the Hughes bill had to do with really robust assessments and behavior planning for kids with serious maladaptive behaviors. Um, basically, the school districts were saying it was too expensive to do it. And so now, no, there are no reporting requirements? No, there are not. Um, so then how do you know when these incidents happen and whether they were used appropriately. Are parents notified? Is anyone notified? That's what's been difficult for parents, where they... I know when I spoke, spoke with Bonnie, Stewart's mom, she said parents either directly or obliquely suggest, how could you have let this go on for so long? This was 11 months, and you could hear In the Candell case. In the Candell case, uh, you could hear your son screaming when she pulled up in the parking lot at school. And she said, it is very hard to know what's going on. You are trusting these people to be doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And in her case, she was lucky in that they were getting reports, some, some level of reporting from the school, but many times parents don't even know what's going on. And I do want to point out that uh, Oakland Unified School District did issue um, a, a statement on this. And once the decision came out by the um, U.S. Department of Education, it basically said that the district's highest priority is to provide safe learning environments for all students. And it says that it will actively comply with the terms of the resolution under the finding. So, Suge, in this case, now that a settlement has been reached, what does Oakland Unified School District have to do to comply? So OCR in Oakland agreed that 
Oakland Unified School District was going to do um, a number of things to address this issue of restraint and seclusion. The first kind of big thing is that they um, are, not, whenever they enter into a new contract with one of these, you know, private schools, that the, the school is not supposed to be using prone restraint. Um, the other thing is, is that they're supposed to develop a protocol to monitor whenever there's a report of restraint or seclusion, and then, you know, have a have a protocol in place about how to address how to address that situation. And another thing that they've agreed to do is that they're going to hire an outside expert uh, who's going to come in, teach school district staff about the dangers and harms of restraint and seclusion, and also what are some positive alternatives. Jane, how many other states allow restra prone restraint and, and seclusion, and are there states that have outlawed it? Suge would be a better one to answer that on the legal front. Right. Um, so our agency did do a report, uh, I think last year, where we analyzed all the different states and what their legislation says. And I think that I can say that California is behind the curve. We're not at the bottom of the heat, but we're definitely behind the curve. There are lots of other states, um, you know, Alabama, Alaska, Hawaii, Rhode Island, I can, you know, list a bunch, but that have much more comprehensive and protective laws than California does, which isn't to say California doesn't have anything, but we're definitely, like, mm. you know, less than 50 percent. So, Jane, bottom line, this decision, a huge wake-up call, do you think, to other school districts that um, allow prone restraint and seclusion to perhaps provide better monitoring and reporting? Absolutely. That's what I'm hearing from people I speak with, that it is a very exciting time for them that the federal government is saying, this is not okay, you're breaking the law. If you do this, at, special education students are students first. You can't treat them with that much difference. All right. Well, thank you to you both. Uh, Suj Lee with Disability Rights California and Jane Meredith Adams with EdSource. Thank you. Thank you. Turning now to tech, it's no secret the Bay Area's tech industry has a glaring gender gap in its workforce. This week, Apple released its annual diversity report. It shows a tiny increase in female employees. Women make up 23 percent of technical roles at Apple. That's a 1 percent increase over last year. Still, it's higher than the percentages at two other Silicon Valley giants. At Google, women account for 19 percent of tech positions, and at Facebook, 17 percent. Recently, a group of women in tech started a nonprofit venture called Project Include to track and improve diversity. One of its founders is Tracy Chow, a former engineer at Pinterest. Tracy, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, in 2013, you posted an article on Medium uh, highlighting the diversity gap in tech. It got, it created pretty much a firestorm. It's kicked off a wave of disclosures from tech companies about the makeup of their workforce. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the latest report out from Apple showing a 1% increase in tech roles there? For women, that is. I think what it's saying, um, what the reports are saying is that it's difficult to make change. And we knew that it would be difficult to make this change, especially on top of big employee bases. Apple employs a lot of people, so to make changes in that number is going to take a lot of sustained effort over many years. I am encouraged to see that the numbers are improving slightly, and hopefully they can keep up that trend. So what are companies doing now that they weren't doing before in terms of trying to improve diversity? Yeah. The first step was actually tracking those numbers. Um, and so part of the reason why I had written that Medium post in 2013 was that there was this irony around the fact that our industry is so data-driven and there was no data at all around diversity and what our demographics look like. And so the first step was actually just having those numbers so you even understand where we were and what that baseline was. What we saw when companies started releasing their data, though, from the first set of reports in 2014 to, the, to 2015 and then 2016 was that it's hard to, know, to change those numbers. Uh, and so what we're seeing now is that companies are trying to figure out what to do exactly. So um, what are they doing? There are a number of different efforts. Um, some are more focused around pipeline, which is kind of the shorthand in industry for saying that the educational system isn't producing enough grads for us to hire. Is that true, um, though, or is, that, or is that more passing the buck to the there, education there's system? There's a little bit of that. Um, I would say that the pipeline issues are there. And if you look at the numbers of women and um, 
minorities, which is black and Hispanic students who are studying computer science, there are disparities there. So there is something about the edu educational system that we need to address. But of course, there is much more than that. Uh, and so when we look at industry numbers, there's also still that disparity. There's not as many um, blacks and Latinos being hired uh, into technical roles as are graduating from computer science programs, for example. So mm -hmm. there is that gap there. And then we look at retention numbers and promotion numbers. So once people make it into industry, they're not all staying at the same rates. Uh, so one stat is that for women in tech over a 10 year period, 41% will leave versus 17% of men. So more, That's more than- That's an astounding number. Yes. That's nearly half So women are, women are leaving at also more than twice the rate that men are. Why are they leaving? There's a whole bunch of factors in there. A lot of it is going to be cultural, um, kind of the norms around how the tech industry does work, how it promotes people, uh, what kinds of personality types and work styles are rewarded and promoted. Um, a lot of the cultural issues that drive people out include just making people feel uncomfortable. Um, there's not a, a good place for them there. And so then is Project Include doing anything about that, the retention issue as well? Yeah, so Project Include's efforts are trying to give a more comprehensive framework for companies to understand how to address diversity and inclusion issues. Um, so that phrase diversity and inclusion is actually a very good one to look at diversity, refer more to just having those different people, uh, different backgrounds represented. Inclusion is actually making sure that people all have that chance to succeed. So then and, what are you doing to help these companies, specific right. things that you're giving them guidance on? Yeah, so on our website, projectinclude.org, we have a lot of our recommendations listed out there. We're trying to provide a general framework, a comprehensive framework, so it's not just about one-off solutions. It's about understanding this is a very large problem and needs very concerted efforts and sustained efforts. And we have a number of different recommendations that are listed out on our website, a lot of links to resources. So Project Include has been in place for about three months. Elvin Powell, who made headlines in her court case against Kleiner Perkins, is mm -hmm. also a co-founder. Are you working with specific companies now? I understand that 800 companies signed up to have you advise them. What did you ultimately yeah, we do? Had, we had a lot of people um, apply to, to be involved. So we're running two programs right now. One is called Startup Include and one is VC Include. In Startup Include, uh, we've actually selected 10 companies that we're partnering very closely. And these are companies where we saw that they had executive commitment towards diversity and inclusion and were willing to try to make changes. Um, and so with these 10 companies in our cohort, we're working with them to define the metrics that we collectively think are good to track. Uh, and then, you know, a few months in, uh, we want to be checking in on these different companies to see how uh, they're doing in terms of impl implementing different recommendations that Project Include has put out there. And for us also, we understand that the recommendations we've put out there are a first draft. Mm -hmm. And we want to solicit feedback and see what works and what doesn't. You graduated from Stanford with a master's degree in uh, computer science. Both your parents have PhDs in mm -hmm. computer uh, science as well. What has it been like for you personally as a woman in tech? I've had a range of experiences. Um, I've definitely experienced being marginalized and being discounted on behalf of my gender. Um, so it was surprising to me having come from this whole tradition of being in computer science and growing up in the Bay Area. I actually experienced quite a bit of unconscious bias, sexism, discrimination. Um, that How did that manifest itself? There were just a lot of little things that would come up. People would doubt whether or not I belonged in computer science or just make these comments. That felt to me, if, what people will call it now is uh, death by a thousand paper cuts. Mm. All the little questions like, are you sure you want to do this? Have you considered other roles? Um, are you sure you know what you're doing? Do you need help? That sort of thing. Um, as well as more egregious comments like, oh, you're too pretty to code. Or mm. I assumed you weren't very good at coding because technical ability and physical attractiveness are inversely correlated. Wow. All sorts of comments to that effect. Um, and then just in the workplace, there are more subtle things like when I wanted to go up for projects, having to fight a little bit harder, um, having my technical points being debated just a little bit longer or discredited. Um, so there's a lot of those things that would come up uh, and it didn't feel necessarily that people were out, outright sexist, um, but there were just a lot more headwinds that I had to approach. And do you see that situation getting any better now? 
I'm not sure. It's hard to say from my own personal experience as I've also be, become more experienced, um, become more senior in my work. And so it's hard to say just for me, it has gotten a lot better. Uh, some of it has to do with the work environment. Uh, when I joined Pinterest, I had the sudden revelation that there were really good workplaces to be. It was the first place I felt like I was treated as an engineer and not a female engineer. But it was an experience that it was the first time and I'd never known before what it felt like to be treated so equitably. Mm. Well, Tracy, thanks for being here. I understand that you left your software engineering job at Pinterest about two months ago and you're about to move to New York to yeah. test out new adventures. So much luck to you in New York. Yeah, thank you so much. Tracy Chow, thank you. Thanks. On the art scene, West Edge Opera is back with three exciting operas, all performed in a previously abandoned Oakland train station. And in her 25th and final season, music director and conductor Marin Alsup prepares to take her final bow at this year's Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music. These are just some of the arts and entertainment events happening around the Bay Area. KQD senior arts editor Chloe Beltman is back with us now to share some of her top picks. Chloe, always good to see you. Good to see you too, Twee. Well, Tony Bennett left his heart in San Francisco. I left my heart in I feel like I need a glass of wine right about now, and <laughs> the city is loving Tony Bennett right back. Big uh, day coming up for him on August 19th in the city. Yeah, the city is celebrating Tony Bennett's 90th birthday. 90. 90 years wow. old. Uh, the artist Bruce Wolf, the sculptor, has been commissioned to make an eight foot tall bronze sculpture of the crooner, multi uh, Grammy Award winning singer. It's going to be placed on the top of Knob Hill uh, outside the Fairmont Hotel. That's actually where Bennett first sang I Left My Heart in San Francisco in public in December of 1961. Nice bit of history there. And the Giants are getting in on this big day, too. That's right. The 19th is also being declared Tony Bennett night by the uh, San Francisco Giants. <laughs> Tony Bennett all day, all night on August 19th. All right, let's move on to the visual arts. There's an upcoming show by uh, contemporary graphic artist Shepard Ferry. He's perhaps best known for a work from the 2008 presidential election. That's right, Tweem. Many people will be familiar with this poster, uh, Hope by Shepard Ferry, uh, very important for the 2008 presidential elections. And uh, so Shepard Ferry has reinterpreted these iconic photographs from Jim Marshall from the 1960s, Cesar Chavez, Johnny Cash, and, and also photographs sort of displaying ideas of social issues, gun control, mass incarceration, things like that. And this exhibition, American Civics at the San Francisco Art Exchange, which runs through September the 30th, is all about putting a face on some of these social issues. And people can actually buy the prints. It's oh. a, yeah, it's a limited edition of 100 signed prints that are being run and they cost $3,500 each. And where does all that money go? Well, 10% of it actually goes to a variety of charities, including the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Okay. And he, he has a very strong uh, social justice motivation. And his, one of his messages, or he hopes, is to question everything. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely part of Shepard Ferry's credo. Okay. Uh, heading south to Santa Cruz now, the Cabrillo Festival. Summers in Santa Cruz would not be the same without them. And this year, uh, this is a milestone year. Yes, um, it's the final year that Marin Alsop is going to be the music director there. Mm. Yes, she's been there for 25 years. She's a very important figure in the classical music world. You know, the, the first woman to ever get the top job at a major symphony orchestra in Baltimore. And she's par cleaved a path for women conductors all over the country and beyond, frankly. So, uh, yeah, this is a festival where we're going to be able to hear music by composers like Anna Klein and Mason Bates, and also a terrific world premiere by John Adams. Should we take a little, a little listen? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, Lola Montez does the spider dance, and it'll be performed this uh, weekend, this Saturday, if you can make it out there. Fantastic. Who's going to replace her, by the way? Well, uh, they don't know yet. Okay. All right. Um, we will find out when they're ready to announce. That's now, right. 
Uh, moving on to the world of books, uh, for those who really, really love books, not just reading them, but, but seeing how they're made, there is something special in San Francisco for those folks. That's right. So the San Francisco Center for the Book, which is this hidden gem sort of near Potrero Hill, has an exhibition that runs through October the 16th called 2020 Vision. It's not looking back at 20 years of this organization's history, but in fact looking forward to see who are the emerging artists in this field. What is the state of uh, book arts for the next 20 years? Um, so uh, one of my favorite favorite pieces in this show is called Man Eater. It's a set of four books by Hannah Batzel, hand printed, hand bound. Oh, we're seeing it right there. This is it, right. They kind of look like boys adventure books from maybe a hundred years ago, but they're pretty dark. Um, they've, if you, could, you can read them separately, but then if you put them all together and, and, and look at them in this sort of nesting doll, Russian nesting doll fashion, um, they tell a story of, of greed and colonialism. Hmm. All right, what can we learn about the future of art books from this show? Well, I think we, because there's such a variety of work there across so many different media, some things are funny, some things are serious, and they use all kinds of fabrics and papers and different shapes and sizes. It's really an amazing a feast for the eyes. You take away the idea that book arts are alive and well, even though they're a very old, old ancient art, and that there's no particular aesthetic or, or overarching direction. Okay, and this is running through October 16th. Indeed. Okay, and finally, edgy opera. Do those two words go together? Um, Oakland's West Edge yeah. Opera apparently has it going on. That's right, definitely. Now, uh, West, because they're performing in this disused uh, 16th Street station, which is in West Oakland, it's an amazing space that kind of They're got destroyed cool in, the, in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and has been out of use for a while. But um, also Edge, because they do really edgy work. Um, we're seeing uh, footage now from Powder Her Face, which is, oh, and here's Cunning Little Vixen. Powder Her Face is a piece by the British composer Thomas Addis. It was written in the 1990s. And, and Cunning Little Vixen is by Leos Janacek. It's a 1920s opera. All three of the operas, also Agrippina by Handel, deal with really strong, interesting female characters. Yeah, and Powder Her Face uh, dramatizes the sexual obsessions of uh, a British duchess, and that's not something you see too common in, in opera, because usually when they talk about promiscuity, it's, it's you know, male promiscuity in, mm -hmm. in operas. Well, and plenty of female promiscuity too, but it tends not to be uh, women of high rank necessarily. I mean, you know, the Duchess of Argyle was somebody who was made tabloid news headlines in, in the UK, in, 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 particularly in the 1960s, for her sexual exploits and her messy divorce and all of that. And yeah, Thomas Addis uh, dramatizes the, the, the events of her life. All right, and for those who want more information on tickets and exactly when these shows are playing, where should people go? KQED.org slash arts. All right. That just rolled right off your tongue. I'm you very that, used to you saying it. You got that memorized. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a great weekend. I, I, you could pick from any of these things, <laughs> Chloe, for the weekend. Absolutely. I'm going to be off to Cabrillo, actually. Okay. All right. I may be on your heels. <laughs> Chloe, thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Twee. <laughs> and that does it for us. I'm Twee Boo. Thanks so much for watching. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org.